All right, so the lesson for today will be about alcohol and ether. All right, so basically we're going to learn about properties of alcohol and ether, the naming rules for alcohol and ether, and finally some reactions regarding alcohol and ether. Well, um, we are going to start a series of lessons on the different functional groups. All right, um, this infographics gives you a list of most functional groups. And in green check mark are the ones that we've already done. Now thiol, well, the one on the right on the middle uh, row, we don't have time to mention thiol, so I'm just gonna exclude that one. But we're gonna learn the rest of the functional groups. And we're gonna be learning two functional groups per lesson. And in this lesson, it will be alcohol and ether. All right now, I'm grouping two functional groups that are similar uh, for them to be taught in the same lesson. And you'll see why alcohol and ethers are similar. So first of all, um, what are they used for? For alcohol, it's very obvious what alcohol is used for. Um, it has two major roles with humans. One is for consumption. Basically, you just drink that. And the other will be for disinfection, okay? And different types of alcohols are used for different purposes. Um, they're not interchangeable. Well, actually, you can use drinking alcohol to disinfect, but you cannot drink disinfecting alcohol. Okay? You cannot go to Shoppers Drug Mart, get the isopropyl alcohol, the rubbing alcohol, and drink that. No, that is highly toxic. So alcohol and ethers, um, they are structurally similar to water. So basically, they are water with a substitution on the hydrogen. Okay, so water is H2O, as depicted in the figure A. So oxygen with two hydrogens on each side. Now, if you were to substitute one of the hydrogen for a carbon chain, it doesn't matter how long that carbon chain is, then you will get an alcohol. So an alcohol will be an OH group attached to a carbon chain. If you were to substitute both hydrogens on the uh, oxygen for carbon chains, you will get an ether instead. Okay, an ether is just oxygen bonded to two different carbon chains. And those carbon chains can be the same or different. It essentially is basically a long carbon chain that has been cut in two by an oxygen in the middle. All right, so now that we know what they are, let's look at them one at a time. So let's start with alcohol and the definition of alcohol would be something or well, an organic compound with a hydroxyl functional group, OH. Okay, so a hydroxyl group is just OH. And all alcohols, including the one that we drink, are considered to be toxic. Well, in fact, um, you can argue that everything is toxic. It just depends on the dose, all right? Even water, is toxic. There is a dose of water that you can drink that will kill you. It's just that some substances are more toxic than others. Right? And alcohol comes in varying degrees of toxicity. Ethanol um, is the least toxic one. So we drink that one, we dilute it down. We don't drink pure alcohol, that's crazy. Um, beer is about 5% alcohol, and if you drink vodka, well, there's 40%, and I heard, in, I heard in Russia there's higher. But, you know, you don't drink pure alcohol, okay? Some other alcohols, like uh, rubbing alcohol, propanol, that is very toxic. We don't drink that at all. All right. So there are different types of alcohols. Um, there's primary, uh, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. So primary, secondary, and tertiary, those are numbers. Okay, they refer to one, two, and three. Now, what are we talking about? So if you have a primary alcohol, that means your hydroxyl group is bonded to the terminal carbon. What do we mean by the terminal carbon? It is the first or last, depends on how you want to count this, the first or last carbon. Okay, so that means your carbon is bonded to only one of the carbons. Okay, the other two bonds are with hydrogens or something else, not a carbon. So on the left side, the, the first picture is a primary alcohol. A secondary alcohol will be an alcohol, well, a hydroxyl bonded to a carbon that has two carbon chains. 
attached to it. And the last bond of that carbon is probably a hydrogen. It could be something else, but it only has two carbon chains. So it is in the middle. And lastly, a tertiary alcohol is a hydroxyl bonded to a carbon that has three alkyl groups. So three other carbons bonded to it. So hence tertiary. Right, so you need to know the difference structurally between primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohol. So let's talk about naming. Naming alcohol is a little bit different from what we have been learning. So we're going to update the rules again. First off, you have to identify the longest chain. Okay, that doesn't chain. Or the ring. Okay, second, you have to number the carbons so that the hydroxyl group has the smallest possible number. You remember last time we said that you got a number so that the double or triple bond has the smallest number, they have the highest priority. Well, that's been updated. In fact, all functional groups have highest priority over double or triple bonds. And hydroxyl is a functional group, so this takes precedence over double and triple bonds. And if there's only one OH, very easy, add OL at the end. So it should end with O. If you have more than one, then you need suffixes, okay, such as diol, telling you there's two, or triol, telling you there's three. And lastly, of course, you identify all the other branches and you will name them normally. So let's apply these rules to that example right there. In the example, you can see that there are four carbons in the chain, so that must be butan. Okay, but means four. And if you just count, you can count from the left or you can count from the right. And which one do you pick, from the left or from the right? Anyone? Left. Obviously the left. You might be tempted to count from the right because if you count from the right, chloro will be carbon one. That is the smallest number, but that's not what we're looking for, okay? We need to make sure that the hydroxyl is the smallest number if you come from the left, it will be a two. From the right, it will be a three. So you obviously come from the left. Meaning that this will be a two all, not a three all. And that will be a four chloro. So finally, put this together. Four chloro beats in two all. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so notice the A-N in red. Um, I made those letters in red for a reason. To show you that you need the AN, you can't say butyl, okay? And you have to have the N, otherwise it would be just A and O together. You cannot have two vowels together. So let's do a little summary here before we go on. First of all, let's talk about the priority hierarchy in uh, numbering carbons. We update this almost every lesson, but this will probably be the final draft of this rule the highest priority of everyone will be a functional group. Okay, in this case, we have hydroxyl. That's gotta have the lowest possible number. If you have a tie, then you look at the second tier, double versus triple bond. Those have the second hierarchy in terms of priority. So you gotta satisfy the lowest number for the double triple bond next. If that's a tie, you go for the lowest set of numbers, and if you tie for all three, then you will go to the last one, alphabetical order, okay? So that's how you determine how to number the carbons. Let's actually do some of these examples before we go to the right side. So the first one, on top left, you have one carbon and OH. Okay, it doesn't get simpler than that. One carbon is methane, OH, methanol, okay? The second one, two carbons, ethane, with OH, so ethanol. So these are common alcohols. We just simply refer to them by their actual IUPAC name because it's simple enough. Methanol and ethanol. Uh, methanol, you drink this, you go blind, essentially. Ethanol, you drink, well, not you guys, but you know, people well, old enough. They drink and they're fine, as long as you don't drink too much. Again, it's toxic. Um, you don't want to overdose on alcohol. If you move to the right, uh, you see three carbons and an OH. That would be pentan-1-ol, not pentanol. 
If you say pentanol, then you're not specifying where the alcohol is. It could be on carbon one or carbon two, propen two O. Right, so now it does make a difference, so you have to give me the number. Whereas for methanol and ethanol, there's only one possible place to put the alcohol. Even on ethanol, you have two carbons, but there's no way it's going to be on carbon two, because if you move to the other carbon, that would just become carbon one. So that's why for three and higher, you need to specify where the alcohol is. On a side note, propen 2 o um, the one on the bottom, that is rubbing alcohol you can buy from Shoppers Drug Mart. Okay, if you just look at the bottle on Shoppers, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, it will say isopropyl alcohol. That's the common name. Or isopropanol. Again, that's the common name for propen 2 o Usually people refer to this by their common name, isopropyl alcohol. Nobody says propen 2 o but you know, unfortunately that is the IUPAC official name. The one on the left, on the bottom with the benzene ring and the alcohol, we learned that benzene can become a group, and then the naming rule for that would be phenol. So therefore, the alcohol version of this would be phenol. It's not benzol, it's phenol. Okay, just make sure you know that. Now let's bring your attention to the right side of this page. Notice the naming pattern. I use pentane as an example. So pentane, the naked alkane. Okay, that's just pentane. If it's an alkene, um, you change to E and E. Now you got to specify what the double bond is. So pent one E. Okay, notice pent. There's nothing after the T. One and then E. Okay, because pentene sounds nice. Next one, if you have more than one double bond, let's say two, I will be penta one three diene. You need the A because you got to separate the T and the D. Okay, we've learned this already. It's just a review. If you have an alcohol, though, you have pentanol. Okay, that rolls off the tongue. So you need the A and the N. You can't just have pent. That would be pentol. That just doesn't sound right. So it's pentanol. So pentan with A N, one O. But if you have more than one alcohol, it gets weird. You don't really take away any letters from pentane. You have the whole thing. So you have pentane, one, three, diol. So it's not pentadiol. It's pentane diol. That is something you just have to remember. So I summarized the pattern here um, just to show you how many letters should you leave for the alkane. Make sure that you recognize the pattern and you don't spell this wrong because spelling does matter. Okay, so do we have any questions before we move on? Cool. So example one. Which one is carbon one? And then after you determine carbon one, tell me which direction do we count and name the compound. So does anyone want to take a crack at this? Which carbon is carbon one, guys? You shouldn't really be thinking about that. It's quite obvious. The one with the hydroxyl group. Thank you, the hydroxyl group, that's it. You don't have to worry about anything else, okay? Because I gave you the priority hierarchy right there. Number one priority, you want the functional group to be as small as possible. There's the hydroxyl. That better be carbon one, that's it, done. All right, so now the question becomes, do I go clockwise or counterclockwise? Which one is it? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Does anyone else have a different answer? Anyone? So you all agree it's counterclockwise. So why not clockwise? What's wrong if you just number this clockwise? You get a one, three, five out of the way, right? We'll have methyl group first instead of chloro. Yes. The set of numbers wouldn't change, but Alphabetic order does come into play in this question. Because the first three are tied, um, functional group has to be one. Okay, we settled that. There is no double triple bond, so skip that one. Lowest set of numbers, well, it's going to be one, three, four, five. It doesn't matter which direction. So the tiebreaker is alphabetical order. Chloro C comes before methyl M. So it's got to be counterclockwise. All right, so that means this is cyclohexane because 
Cyclops in the ring, Hex and Six. That's a 1 0. That's a 3 chloro. That's a 4 chloro. That's a 5 methyl. So you put all of this together. So 3 4 dichloro, 5 methyl, cyclo, hexanol. You do not need the 1 because if you're in a ring, Obviously, the alcohol is carbon-1, right? So there's no need to specify. So you do not need the one cyclohexanol will suffice. So any questions? Alrighty. I'm going to give you some time um, to work on these two. Actually, these two are pretty difficult because they have two alcohols each, and the one on the bottom has a double bond. I just want to see... Uh, whether you can do this without me and then I'll take this up um, very shortly. I'll give you like two minutes on this. All right, so for the first one, the first thing you do, you have to count the parent. So you have two ways of doing this to get the longest chain. Um, the longest chain is six. You could go from the left or the right. No, it's quite obvious you count from the left. Okay, because if you count from the left, you have a 1, 3 for your alcohol, whereas if you count from the right, it's a 4, 6. That's ridiculous. So all the rules tell you to count from the left. Meaning that this is hexane. Well, that's the alkane version of the parent. I included A and N, E because I know that there are two alcohols. I need a diol, so hexane diol. So, uh, you know, look ahead a little bit when you name. All right, so that's hexane. That is a 1 all. That's a 3 ol And then you have a 2-chloro, two 2-methyl, two and 4-methyl. So you put this together alphabetically. A chloro comes before methyl. So you get 2-chloro, two 2-4-dimethyl, two hexane, 1-3-diol. Okay, I hope you all got this one. The one on the bottom, however, is very difficult, actually, because it has both a double bond and... Um, the functional groups. So first off, which direction do I come from, left or right? Right. You count from the right. It is very tempting to count from the left side, okay, because I've been trying to hammer this home that double bond has to be as small as possible. And on top of that, you have a methyl group there on carbon two. So if you count from the left, you make most people happy. But if you count to the right, you only make the alcohols happy. The rest of them are pissed. doesn't matter. You make the alcohol happy. Okay? The highest priority goes to the hydroxyl. So you must count. From the right side, you disregard the double bond. You disregard the big numbers. So you take that one. And if you do, that will be eight carbons. And there's a double bond. So oct six in. Okay? The double bond starts on carbon six. The branches, well, you have a 3 ol you have a 5 ol 4 methyl, and a 7 methyl. So um, it is time to put all of them together in alphabetical order. 4 7 dimethyl, oct 16, 3 5 diol. All right, the in, E and E, it has the final E because you have di all. Now, without the di, then you wouldn't have the E. I hope I made myself clear. Always separate vowel with contrast. All right, in this case, there is no EZ isomerism. Now, many students tend to forget about the EZ isomerism. Well, in this case, this double bond in particular does not have one because on carbon seven, you can see that carbon seven has two metals. They're exactly identical, so there is no difference. You do not have an isomer. So did I make myself clear regarding how to name alcohols? Nope. All righty. Ring questions are always difficult, okay? Because it's hard to figure out what is carbon one and how to count that. So for the one on the top, uh, carbon one is Of. Yeah. A hydroxyl group. Hydroxyl group. Don't even think. You see a functional group, you don't see any other um, special functional groups, you pick that one, that's carbon one. So, in which direction do you count? 
clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Counter. You go clockwise. The reason that you don't go counter is that if you go counterclockwise, the double bond will have a bigger number. So you satisfy the functional group. The next thing is to satisfy the double bond. So you go this way. All right. And if you go this way, um, that is cyclohex 3N. Cyclo for the ring, hex for six. On carbon three, you have a double bond. So 3N, notice that there is no E this time. It's not 3N because it's only one alcohol. So you don't have the dye, it is just all. That would be a one all. That would be a three chloro, five methyl, and six bromo. Alphabetical order, bromo comes before chloro, comes before methyl. We put this in. So you have six bromo, three chloro, five methyl, cyclohex three enol. You don't need the one. Obviously, the functional group has to be one. So in this case, you can omit the one. Okay, did I make myself clear? This is a tough question because it's a ring, it has branches, it has alcohol and a double bond. Right, it has the whole nine yard. I don't think the question will become harder than that. At least not on the test. All right, the next one, you have three double bonds. In fact, you have no double bonds because that's a benzene. Benzene with two alcohols and two branches, which one is carbon number one? Yeah, you might have to think a little bit. You only have two candidates, the two hydroxyls, which one? The top one? The top one, that is correct. If you pick the top one, and you go clockwise, you will hit up the second one and just, as soon as you can, right? So that's the one, three alcohol, and then immediately follows the two branches. So your numbers are one, three, four, five. Whereas any other combination will either give you a um, bigger set of alcohols or a bigger set of numbers in general. This is the only possible configuration. And to name, you have, well, benzene, that is the parent. Notice that if you have more than one alcohol, you don't have phenol anymore, you just call it benzene. That's a 1-ol, that's a 3-ol, 4-methyl, 5-bromo. Alphabetically, you get 5-bromo, 4-methyl, benzene, 1-3-diol. All right, this is different from a phenol because a phenol only has one OH. The whole thing is called a phenol. This one, because you have two, you gotta name it the normal way, the benzene way, so it's a one three diol. All right, so are we clear on naming alcohols? Okay, so that's as hard as it gets for naming alcohols. That's as complicated as it gets. So now let's actually look at some properties. Alcohols have high boiling points. All right, um, you know that the boiling point of water is 100. Um, the alcohol, well, at least the one that we drink, is around 78. So it's lower than water, but still substantially high compared to, let's say, ethane, the, the gas. The reason is due to the intermolecular forces. Consider methane, a natural gas. The boiling point is minus 162, which is, you know, that can never happen on Earth unless we synthetically create that in a lab. So methane is going to be a gas on Earth. That's why it's called natural gas. However, if you just slap on one OH group on that methane, it can become methanol. Now the boiling point becomes a whopping 65 degrees Celsius. Okay, again, I don't think anywhere on Earth is that hot. So methanol will probably always be a liquid on Earth. Ethanol has a boiling point of 78. Whereas propanoanol, the one with three carbon, a three carbon alcohol is 97. So as you can see, as you increase the number of carbons, the boiling point increases, which makes total sense. We learned this in uh, unit one. As you have a longer CH chain, it means you have more surface area for the London dispersion force. The more electrons to make a stronger force, higher surface area, of course, you're gonna have a higher temperature uh, required to boil this. 
Now, why does alcohol have a higher boiling point than an alkane? It has to do with hydrogen bonding. Because you have OH, you have hydrogen bonded to oxygen. That's what you need for hydrogen bonding. And so that hydrogen will be very positive because the oxygen will just basically try to take the electrons away from it. And when it comes near another oxygen, which is highly negative, that will be a hydrogen bond. That's a very strong interaction. So alcohol, due to its ability to do hydrogen bonding, it has relatively high boiling points, okay? Really close to water if your chain number is small. So how do these react? Uh, we have already seen this in the alkene lesson. You take an alkene, you slap water on it, so it undergoes hydration with water, and you will make an alcohol. And which alcohol is made is governed by the Markovnikov rule, which means only secondary alcohols are formed in this way. The rich gets richer, so across the double bond, the carbon in the middle that has less hydrogen will get the OH, and the carbon on the side that has more hydrogen that gets the H. So you have propen 2 all instead of propen 1 all. Does that make sense? So when it comes to hydration with alkene, you make secondary alcohols. What do we do with that alcohol? Well, we could burn that for energy. Well, actually, that's the third use of alcohol I didn't think of. Uh, there are alcohol lamps uh, that you can order. Um, basically, it contains almost pure alcohol. You could just light it up, and there will be a blue flame because of complete combustion. And this releases a lot of energy. You can harness that energy to do some other work. Okay, so the equation, for example, here is um, propen one ol or propen two ol. Uh, doesn't really specify. It's an isomer. You burn that with oxygen, you get water and carbon dioxide, just like burning a hydrocarbon. Okay, the additional oxygen doesn't really change the reaction at all. So um, if you have an alcohol, you can go in reverse. Right? This reaction happens forward and backwards. So propanol, well, actually, this one doesn't specify which um, carbon the oxygen is on. Who cares? Propanol can undergo something called elimination. You eliminate the OH and the H to form a double bond, propene, actually prop1ene, and water. All right. This is also called dehydration because you are literally removing H2O from your molecule. So this is also called a dehydration reaction. So you need to know the name elimination and you need to know what dehydration refers to. All right, so do we have any questions? Okay. All right, so let's do some practice to see whether you understand this. So you're supposed to write the chemical equation for the addition reaction of pent-1-ene and water. All right, so first you have to draw pent one in, and then you got to figure out where to slap the water on and what is the final product. So I'll give you around two minutes. I'll complete this and I'll take this up. All right, so step one, you need to draw pent one in. And it's very simple. It's just five carbons with a double bond on the first carbon. In this drawing, um, I have all the hydrogens displayed because we need to apply Markovnikov's rule, so that's why I'm showing all the hydrogens for more clarity. You don't have to have the hydrogens. In fact, it's better to draw this as a skeleton. You might screw up if you draw this, uh, the hydrogens because um, some students, they just wanted to show everything and they counted the hydrogens wrong. So a carbon will either have three or five bonds and you will lose marks because of that. So just try to draw a skeleton if you can. Don't try to do anything fancy. Um, if you want to, sure, just be careful. All right, so got to slap on the water. Uh, the rich gets richer. Meaning that across the double bond, only two carbons are able to bond. The other three carbons that have only single bonds, they're saturated, don't do anything with them. Okay, so what do I do with that structure? Well, the two carbons, you must break the double bond between them 
And the carbon with one H will get the OH, and the carbon with two Hs will get an additional hydrogen, becomes CH3. So that would be your final structure. Okay, and this will be the alcohol that you're making, pentatool. All right, I hope this is clear uh, for the addition reaction to make an alcohol from an alkene. All right, so let's move on to ethers. Now, ethers are one of the special ones, okay? Now, it's special because it has more than one carbon chain on it. First of all, this thing had a history. People use this as anesthetics because when you sniff this, you pass out. This is called ethoxyethane. Um, we're going to learn the naming later, but we just refer to that as an ether. And, you know, in those movies, there's a handkerchief. You spray something on it, you put it on somebody's mouth, and they pass out. That's how you do a kidnapping. I think we use chloroform now, but you can still use ethoxyethane. I am not telling you how to kidnap people, so, you know, just, I didn't say that. These ethers are very dangerous, okay? They're volatile, meaning that it can easily become a gas. And if you inhale this, it damages your respiratory system. So you have to be really careful with ethers. When I was in university, um, I was in the chemistry lab, right? That was an extremely dangerous course to take. On some days, the experiments are highly dangerous. You can get hurt, worse, you can die. So on one of the days, uh, we're making ethers. One of the byproducts of our organic reaction is an ether, it's a, which is a gas. So we have to use fume hoods. So you have a glass panel that slides down with a chamber and there is a vent that sucks the gas out. You're supposed to do experiments in the fume hood. I did that, okay? I slided the gas door, uh, the glass door down. I put my arms in it and I tried to do my experiments. And then I dropped something. I'm like, oh crap, I gotta get that. And I can't reach it. So what do I do? Um, you know what, I'll, I'll just put my head in and I'll real quick and I'll grab it and come out. So I lifted the fume hood, I put my head in, I reached the thing and I took a breath. Oh, when I came out, I started coughing and um, I felt drowsy. It did not feel good. So I sniffed the ether, All right? You can kind of sniff the ether from other students too because you know, there was like 24 students in that lab. So yeah, you're gonna smell it regardless, but I took a really big whiff uh, when I put my head in there. So we all felt drowsy and yeah, you don't want to make ethers in the lab. Uh, we're not doing that for our lab, even if I have access to that lab. So these are quite uh, dangerous. This is what an ether will look like. You have two carbon chains separated by an oxygen. So the symbol for this will be R, O and R. O separates the two carbon chains. And in organic chemistry, if you see the letter R, that represents an alkyl group, okay? It, just a carbon chain, it could be arbitrarily long. Ethers are actually great solvents, okay? It is able to dissolve both polar and non-polar substances. And as you recall from grade 11, like dissolves like, polar dissolves polar, non-polar dissolves non-polar, but ether, it is both polar and non-polar. The polar part is the oxygen in the middle that enables it to dissolve polar things. The non-polar part would be the metal tails and that enables it to dissolve non-polar substances. And some other properties on like boiling points, well, if you think about the structure, okay, ethers, they have oxygen, yes. They have hydrogen, yes but the hydrogen is not bonded to the oxygen, so they don't do hydrogen bonding, okay? It doesn't have OH group. It has oxygen, that's polar, so the best thing you have is dipole-dipole, okay? So you are a polar molecule, which means you do have higher boiling points than a non-polar molecule. So for example, ethane, just the gas is, well, boiling point is negative 89. Methoxymethane, Basically, still two carbons, is, except you slap an oxygen in the middle, you separate them. Now the boiling point rises to negative 23. It drastically increased because of the polarity of the molecule now. So you have dipole-dipole interactions in addition to London forces. 
The alcohol version of this, ethanol, however, is still two carbons with an oxygen. It's just that the oxygen now has a hydrogen on it. That makes a huge difference because now you're able to do hydrogen bonding. So you have a stronger intermolecular force. You have 78.5. Finally, water, that's just straight up hydrogen bonding. Um, it has 100 degrees. Okay, water has the highest boiling point, well, because water is able to make two hydrogen bonds. It has two hydrogens on the oxygen. All right, so does that make sense? You have to be able to justify the differences in the boiling point between similar compounds. They have different functional groups. All right, so how would you name an ether? And this is actually fairly simple. But this is the one that students tend to forget the most, okay? Because this is very different from the other naming rules. It's different because you have two carbon chains instead of one. So first, you identify the two carbon chains, the two alkyl groups. In this case, you have three carbons on the left, two carbons on the right. So on the left, you have a propyl. On the right, you have an ethyl. Does that make sense? Step two, you name the shorter alkyl group and then you attach the suffix oxy. Whoever is shorter gets oxy. The longer one, you will name it as if it were an alkane. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, propyl, that's the longer one. The alkane version of this name will be propane you would name this propane. The shorter one, the ethyl, you will add oxy, so it becomes ethoxy. Lastly, you number the carbon on the longer carbon chain. You number it such that the oxygen, the oxy, is on the smallest possible carbon. All right, so in this case, well, it is one, two, three. The oxy, the oxygen is attached to carbon one. So that will be a one. You put this together. You have one ethoxy propane. Okay, did I make myself clear? You do need to write the one because if you don't, this could be two ethoxy propane. You need to distinguish the two. So let me, let me just recap. You name the two alkyl groups on the left and on the right. The longer one becomes just a regular alkane. The shorter one becomes an oxy. You count the alkane such that the oxy is on the smallest carbon. You just put it together. So um, do these two examples and I'll take them up in around two minutes. All right, so taking this up, the first one is extremely simple. You have two ethyls, they're the same length, okay? If they're the same length, it doesn't really matter which one you choose. I'm just gonna arbitrarily do this. I'll call the first one ethane, the second one ethoxy. Just put them together, ethoxy, ethane. Uh, you do not need to count the carbon in this case because you will never be on carbon two. The smallest possible number is carbon one. So, ethoxy, ethane. The next one is deceptive. Okay, you might think, wait, there's three on the left, three on the right, but on the left side, you have a methyl group, right? No, there is no methyl group. On the left, you have a butyl, four carbon chain. On the right, you have a propyl, okay? Nobody said that the oxygen has to be on the last carbon. It could be in the middle, like that one. If it's in the middle, you just name it normally. Uh, the longer one will be butane. The shorter one, propyl, becomes propoxy. You start numbering the carbon. You can do this, one, two, three, four, or you can go one, two, three, four upwards. You pick the set of numbers that give you the smallest number for the oxygen. So obviously that one. Okay, so that would be a two. So put it together, you have two propoxy butane, and that would be the name of this structure. Don't fall, that, don't fall for that trap. There is no methyl here. Okay, it is beautiful. And this would conclude the lesson for this one. So we learned about alcohols, the hydroxyl group, difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. We learned about the reaction of alcohols, hydration versus dehydration. 
And uh, we also learn about ethers and how ethers can be used, the ability to dissolve, how to name ethers, and we learn properties of alcohols and ethers, their boiling points, and why they have certain boiling points. Questions, folks? Okay, I'm going to end this here.